everyone. It's really our great pleasure here at George Washington University to welcome Svetlana Bogdinova, who is joining us from the World Bank. She is part of the Doing Business Project. She's going to talk to us about ranking institutional development around the world. Ms. Bogdinova is the Senior Private Sector Development Specialist. As I mentioned, she is on the, the Doing Business team, and she joined that team in 2006. Prior to joining the World Bank, she worked for Booz Allen Hamilton, where she specialized in energy and infrastructure projects. And I must tell you, she came to my class very kindly last semester and inspired them all. In fact, I had two people come up to me later after hearing the presentation about this, wanting to know more about what they could, what they could actually do to intern with and do more with the Doing Business Indicators. So well, uh, please join me in welcoming her. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great uh, pleasure and honor uh, to be here. Um, I had a chance to uh, look through your bios, and I'm very impressed with uh, the quality and uh, diversity of this group. So thank you again for uh, having me here. Uh, my presentation will be in uh, three parts. Uh, first, um, I will talk a little bit about general methodology of the project, about the way we collect the data. Uh, then uh, I will touch upon uh, early results of what is emerging, what kind of trends emerging um, uh, at this point after we had the five years of uh, data. And then at the end, uh, I will talk about results of the Doing Business Online uh, report. Uh, we talk about uh, top reformers and top performance and uh, what kind of uh, reforms we're looking at. Uh, please feel, uh, feel free to interrupt me at um, any point. Um, I hope the discussion will be interactive and we're ready to go. So what is the Doing Business Project is about? Uh, I understand that you already had uh, a chance uh, to get introduced uh, to a number of different indicators, um, such as governance indicators, Transparency International. So we all look um, at the development of various institutions uh, across the world. What the Doing Business Project is uh, looking at is the basic regulatory uh, infrastructure uh, that at this point, 182 economies uh, in the world have. Uh, on uh, your uh, left-hand side, uh, you see uh, all the indicators we're working on. We look at the full life cycle of a company, from starting a business to closing a business. And at certain uh, typical transactions that the company would have to go through um, during its uh, lifetime, such as uh, dealing with construction permits, uh, hiring workers, registering property, getting credit, paying taxes, uh, and executing uh, trade transactions. As you can see, the project evolved quite a bit. Um, the project was started six years ago, and actually there used to be only five indicators, and the initial sample 135 countries. So every year we were adding uh, countries, and since 2007 uh, there were uh, 10 uh, indicators. Besides the main report, we actually have quite a few um, other products related to the Doing Business uh, Data and Project. Uh, it's uh, the Reformers Club and uh, case studies uh, that we produce. Uh, now it will be the third year. Uh, we look at the specific stories uh, of the reformers uh, in given countries, uh, trying to learn uh, what their concrete reform experience was about, what kind of difficulties they had, and uh, we share these experiences with other to be reformers across the world. Uh, besides that, uh, we also have a number of subnational studies. Um, over the years, uh, subnational studies were conducted in Brazil and Mexico, uh, in the Caribbean states and Central Asia. Uh, there, we're trying to look uh, closer uh, at the differences um, among the various regions, again, so that the regions could learn from each other. The methodology of the project is quite simple. There are two types of indicators. Uh, first of all, um, this is so-called uh, time and motion studies. Here you see an example of uh, starting a business procedure in Mauritius, actually one of the countries uh, that ranked in uh, top uh, 10 on the ease of starting a company. Uh, you can see that in order to start a limited liability company in Mauritius, it takes five procedures that take ten, ten, uh, five days and 5% um, of uh, income per capita. How do we collect this data? Uh, we rely uh, on around 8,000 contributors uh, around the world. Typically, it's uh, law firms, entrepreneurs, construction companies, uh, and freight forwarding companies to provide this data. We use standardized surveys. Uh, so this is the same uh, scenario that's being used 
uh, consistently uh, across the world, and we ask uh, these uh, practitioners for uh, a feedback. So if you were to incorporate a company of uh, five uh, local owners uh, with a certain uh, uh, initial capital, and then you will have to hire 50 people to work for the company, what this experience would be like. The second set of indicators is so-called legal uh, indices. Uh, here we actually look um, at the letter of the law um, more than the time and emotion situation. Uh, here is an example of protecting investor, investors indicator. You see that we measure three different aspects. Uh, the case study is talking about uh, an interested party transactions and here we're trying to derive uh, what kind of protections minority shareholders would have in a such situation. We look at the extent of direct liability, at the ease of shareholder suit, and uh, extent of uh, disclosure. Even though I mentioned that the methodology is quite uh, simple, um, the amount of research uh, that they went uh, into developing the project is quite significantly. As you can see, uh, we have six background papers um, published in uh, major peer-reviewed uh, academic journals. Um, I think at this point it's about 1,000 citations in uh, economic um, uh, publications. So we do um, take this very seriously and uh, we do work uh, with uh, top academics uh, in order to um, develop and refine our methodology. So what kind of patterns uh, emerge um, while we look at the doing business uh, data across the years? Uh, you can see uh, that we tracked over 1,000 business regulatory reforms that uh, took place uh, since the inception of the project in 2004. The most popular reform every year is a business startup reform. I mean, this is, this is pretty intuitive, I think. Uh, creating new companies create more jobs in the economy, so this is the least controversial uh, reform. And the governments are very eager to enable business startup. Uh, you can see that 154 um, out of 181 economies reformed in at least one of 10 areas covering, covered in doing business. So in a nutshell, the whole world is reforming. Uh, and over 175 reforms uh, in 69 economies were informed by the doing business project. What does it mean? Um, as I mentioned, um, the project generates quite a bit of a discussion around the world and often countries look at their neighbors and their performance and the best practices uh, they could learn from in order to uh, design their, all, uh, their own um, reform programs. Another interesting trend um, is that, again, uh, the whole world uh, is improving their regulatory environments. Uh, you can see uh, that each of the regions uh, tracked in the doing business indicators uh, has the upward trend in terms of regulatory reforms. Again, another interesting pattern uh, that all sorts of countries are reforming, large and small, high income and low income, and again, you have the regional trend. High rankings uh, is not the sole prerogative uh, of the high income countries. Uh, we often uh, hear a bit of a discussion that uh, high income rich countries uh, have more opportunities to uh, refine their institutions, to implement reforms, and this is not exactly the case. Um, as you can see, even the low income countries rank, some of them rank much higher than some of the high income countries. Here again, the slides uh, demonstrating um, what the distribution is like uh, in small and large economies. Uh, actually, uh, we've been publishing a separate uh, report on the small island developing uh, states, um, and we've done a little simulation to see uh, if all the small islands were to implement the best practices from um, other small islands, where this state of the small islands would be ranked. And it turned out it would be number one in the world. And of course, we hear a bit of a discussion that small economies have you know, less resources and very constrained in terms of improving their um, environment due to the capacity. But we always say that you don't have to go very far in order to find best practices. It's likely that a comparable economy or your neighbor already has a practice. So now turning to the highlights of the last year reports, um, it was uh, the busiest reform uh, year ever recorded uh, since the inception of the project. Uh, 239 reforms in 113 countries. 
Uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia was once again the most active reformer. Uh, this is something that we've seen quite consistently uh, over the years. Uh, possibly uh, one of the reasons is um, accession to EU. Uh, many countries had to comply with EU regulations and that was the main uh, stimulus for, for the reforms. Uh, another region that many of these countries already had quite developed uh, institutions. Uh, also um, issues that related to health and education were less um, pressing in this country so that the government could focus uh, on business regulatory reforms rather th than uh, building a basic infrastructural institutions. You can also see uh, that uh, it was a busy reform year in Africa as well. Uh, and this is something that, uh, of course, uh, we'd be very happy to see. Three out of top 10 reformers last year came from the Africa region. Who are the top 30 performers in the project? I think uh, probably the top part of the list is um, hardly surprising. It's um, high-income OECD countries. The interesting uh, players here, of course, um, countries from the former Soviet Union, it's uh, uh, Georgia, <coughs> Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia. Again, as you can see, Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia uh, obviously uh, countries that uh, invested a lot of resources prior to uh, EU accession uh, to uh, refine uh, their regulatory institutions. Uh, Georgia has been consistently one of the top uh, reformers in our project across the years. In fact, uh, when it was first uh, ranked in the report, it was um, 118 on the ease of doing business. And over three years, um, through uh, a comprehensive uh, reform uh, program, it's uh, jumped to number 15. Please. Again, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, we only look at the 10 different areas of business regulations. So this is, this is quite a narrow approach. Uh, we have a standardized case study for all um, 10 situations. We do not measure a number of very important issues such as political stability, such as quality of infrastructure or uh, quality of workforce. In our definition, reform um, is something that affects um, our indicators. For example, a business startup reform. Um, if a country implements a one-stop shop for business registration or electronic filing, this will show up in our data as, as a reform. Same, for example, for property registration. If um, a registry digitized is, its records, so therefore they can implement the, the computer search uh, of the title, so the processes in the reg registry became more efficient, uh, this is a reform. If a customs uh, implements uh, electronic declaration lodgement or implements um, the account management system, again, it's a reform. But the way we track reforms, uh, it's always through our standardized surveys. Of course, many countries reform on a much broader scale, but we do not have a way of, of measuring that. We do not measure macroeconomic reforms or you know, fiscal reforms. So again, the project should be viewed as a very useful uh, piece of the big puzzle of regulation or investment climate, but we always have to remember that the methodology is quite limited. And you know, the other data points and you know, research, qualitative and quantitative, that will have to be employed in order to have the full picture uh, of the situation in the country. So, please. Exactly. So the scenarios are very simple. I already gave an example of business startup, uh, for example, in property registration. Uh, the scenario, which is identical for all uh, countries in our sample, is that two commercial companies transferring a title of, of a warehouse from one to another. And again, we ask uh, practitioners, uh, so what are the procedures like? Uh, how long does it take? Uh, how many steps and how much does it cost? 
And we typically try to get information from both uh, public sector and private sector. We typically speak with uh, company registers, property registers, architectural authorities, and also uh, on the other side with, with the companies that use their services. So it always helps us to reconcile uh, uh, the data and come up with uh, most objective numbers. Please. Let me just flip to the slide uh, that will show you the uh, the top the top performance. So we will see which African countries we are, we're talking about. So we talk about Senegal, uh, Burkina Faso, and 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 Botswana, and. To a certain extent, Egypt, since it's Africa, but it belongs to a MENA region. Um, so in some of them, the post-conflict countries, um, we see um, very strong influence of the international community, of the donor organizations, but also it's always regional competition. Because we typically look at the pool of countries that um, have similar situation in terms of resources, uh, in terms of human <coughs> capacity, and what the governments realize that uh, the environment mostly conducive uh, for doing business for both internal and external investors is absolutely critical to attracting investment. So I would say this is both internal and, uh, and, and external factors. Since we move to the um, top performance um, table, uh, we can see that uh, four top countries come from the uh, former communist space, so to speak, from uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Again, there is an interesting story behind um, each uh, of the top reformers. For example, uh, Azerbaijan reformed because uh, the government made a very conscious effort to move away from total rely reliance on, on the oil-based economy and invest into uh, small and medium uh, enterprise development. Um, Albania, of course, it's a EU accession. Again, this is a very important uh, factor. It's still very critical um, in the Central European space. Uh, Kyrgyz Republic is um, striving to create a center of uh, regulatory uh, excellence uh, within the region. Here we deal with a situation that um, a small country is um, located in quite a difficult geopolitical situation. It's double and locked. Uh, it's uh, next to uh, uh, a big and powerful and oil-rich country of uh, Kazakhstan. So here the government is thinking, what can we offer to, to investors? And one of their um, kind of a package items uh, is uh, this conducive uh, regulatory environment. Uh, Belarus is looking to open up uh, its economy uh, towards uh, and be more open towards the, the European uh, Union countries. And that was one of the major reasons why uh, this country reformed as well. So again, if you look at the, at the African countries, um, here we have a, a quite a bit of a regional competition. And also uh, an interesting factor, we typically see 85% uh, um, of uh, reforms taking place within the first 15 months of the new government. So when the new government is ambitious, has the appetite for reform, so if it's a government of the last year of it's time in office, so we're unlikely to see any major reforms. So now I would like to walk you through uh, some uh, examples uh, of reforms that we track, and I think that will help to um, answer some of your earlier questions. So here we look um, at um, uh, business startup reform in, in, in Azerbaijan. So what was done, uh, all procedures uh, related to a business startup were consolidated in one-stop shop. Uh, physically and electronically. Uh, so the, the, the new uh, uh, business startup center was, was built and it was connected to all the relevant authorities that uh, required to authorize business startup electronically. So now it's indeed a one-stop shop when an entrepreneur comes to one specific office, can fill out electronically um, all the applications and forms and be registered as a company immediately. As you can see, that uh, time was cut by 87% and cost was um, uh, uh, cut by 77%. So it's quite a significant reform. 
An interesting trend uh, that we noticed uh, over the years is not that only emerging market uh, countries reform. OECD countries and high income economies reform as well. Uh, Singapore is probably one of the best examples. We consistently see reforms coming out uh, of the number one uh, in terms of uh, performance in the doing business project. Here you see um, uh, an example of construction uh, permit reforms in, uh, in Singapore. As we always use Singapore um, as an example of a kind of a perfect e-governance system when uh, all regulatory agencies are connected into the same uh, database and most processes um, that uh, a company needs to go through, for example, um, tax filing or property transfer or um, any kind of procedures related to trade could be actually done electronically from your own office. As I mentioned, uh, quite a few reforms came out of the African countries. Here is an example uh, of uh, registering property reform in, in Rwanda. Again, we look at um, time, procedures, and costs that were significant, significantly uh, reduced through elimination of some of the redundant procedures. Uh, getting credit, of course, now in, on everybody's mind, um, taking into account financial crisis um, around the globe. So what we saw last year that quite a few countries strive to improve their credit reporting situation uh, and also uh, improve strengths uh, of uh, the legal rights of creditors and borrowers. Again, one of the reforms that consistently been one of the most popular ones uh, throughout the years, it's um, uh, speeding up trade. Uh, in trade, an interesting um, factor is that um, most of the delays um, take place actually not uh, in the shipment time, because of course we're dealing with a significant number of landlocked countries, but on the stage of the document preparation. And this is something that the governments can quite easily address uh, and simplify. Uh, specialized commercial courts uh, has been one of the most popular reforms uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the contracts indicator. Uh, what it means, um, in many countries, um, civil and criminal and commercial issues are all lumped in the same court, which often creates uh, a big backlog. Creating a separate uh, chamber or specialized commercial court significantly uh, improves and um, expedites uh, resolution of uh, commercial contracts. Uh, in uh, a number of countries also a case management was implemented, uh, meaning that um, the procedures were revamped uh, within the court uh, and uh, also uh, the, the, the cases uh, were tracked electronically. So at any uh, point in time a judge would know at which state each case is. An interesting factor about case management is then uh, when, uh, co when countries uh, would start such a review, they would uncover an, an enormous amount of completely dormant cases that were actually stuck in the court for years, years, and years. And just clearing up uh, all those dormant cases uh, would free up time uh, to hear and to expedite cases that actually need to be heard. Uh, one of the new things that we started doing consistently uh, a couple of years ago is tracking how doing business uh, indicators um, are being used across the world. So you can see that uh, so far we are aware of um, about 30 uh, special working groups uh, created uh, to improve the doing business indicators, of course within a much broader um, framework of the regulatory reforms. Uh, they typically chaired on quite a high level, uh, President, Prime Minister, or Minister of Economy, or Minister of uh, Finance. Um, also, as I mentioned, um, the Reformers Club has been uh, quite a popular venue to gather reformers. Uh, this year, for example, we had this event in Vienna, when uh, top reformers uh, from, I think, most of the uh, 10 countries came and shared their experiences uh, in designing reform programs and implementing them. And uh, also, uh, on a technical level, uh, we organize and facilitate uh, workshops. For example, uh, we had a workshop this year in uh, Mauritius for small island uh, economists. Um, Mauritius ranked 24 in the ease of doing business, uh, and uh, most of the Caribbean islands do not rank that well. So they had an opportunity to travel and to see 
the institutions, which was uh, very helpful and uh, in some cases really um, eye-opening to see such a uh, excellency in, in, in a small um, island in, in Africa. So as we say, uh, the project um, has a limited methodology, uh, but quite uh, a wide uh, use. Uh, we always caution to uh, treat it for what it is, um, not to read too much between the lines. Uh, always use um, <coughs> supplemented uh, materials um, uh, to um, have a full picture uh, in terms of uh, the data. Uh, but also uh, use it as a kind of um, an opening line uh, of a broader conversation of the reforms. Uh, someone asked me a question early on uh, on the macroeconomic implications um, of uh, the reform struck uh, by doing business. We do not suggest uh, uh, causality or correlation between uh, reforms that we track uh, and uh, macroeconomic uh, indicators um, such as GDP. Uh, it would be way too ambitious to say that. Uh, but we look uh, into data on a country level um, basis and here you have uh, examples of some research that has been done uh, in Mexico um, showing um, uh, a certain um, correlation between the number of uh, companies that um, uh, was started up as a result uh, of the recent reform uh, and increase in employment and some eligible industries. It's still early days. Um, I know some of you here are PhD students and we encourage you to use our data for your research. Um, and uh, so hopefully we will have uh, uh, more of such data available in, in the next couple of years. And in the end, I uh, will uh, suggest that you will visit our website. If you have any further questions, um, I will be happy to answer. Thank you. Uh, we typically do um, a, a research about the background of certain company. Uh, I mean, at, at this time, we have a pretty stable pool of contributors. And I have to say that they all work pro bono. We do not pay for uh, the information. Um, we look at the con company profile and we see whether it, it, it's in, involved in litigation or labor law or business startup. And uh, we use it as a base to um, suggest a survey that, that, that would fill out. Uh, uh, showed us his evidence of the difference between what the lawyers and the books tell you mm -hmm. the reforms based on books and reforms on the ground. Mm -hmm. And it was basically, uh, his point was there could be a tremendous difference between the, the action of what is on the ground and, and, and the books. Do you, how, how do you reconcile the differences? Do you, I think you said you both reforms, work reforms, and compared with what the practitioners tell you. Mm -hmm. Do you see similarities or do you see a great gap between? But we do collect all our information from the countries. So the assessment is being done based on information received from practitioners uh, in all 181 countries. No, but we, we, of course we do, but again, this is not our own in-house research. Uh, we typically have a reform section in each of our questionnaire, and we asked practitioners to um, explain how a certain reform uh, affected uh, the practice. Let's say um, reform in business startup, uh, a one-stop shop was implemented. It used to take 20 days to start a business, and now, according to the new law, it takes three days. So our question to practitioner in, in this specific country would be, according to your recent experience, if you registered a company after implementation of this law, how long did it take? Sometimes it takes a day. Sometimes it takes five days. Sometimes it still takes 20 days for various reasons, because the law might not be yet implemented, or there were no underlying uh, regulatory acts implemented, or the registry didn't have a capacity. So this is the way we reconcile the data. So you know we do read the law, and we're aware of the uh, 
physical regulatory changes, but we always ask our practitioners, um, did you see any change after the law was implemented? So that's how we reconcile this information. Can I just follow up on that? Sure. You said you read the law, so you, you can actually see in print the reforms each government says they make. Yes, we do. Okay. And I actually have a law library on our website. Um, where we try to post all the laws in electronic form that we collected uh, around the world. And also we have uh, a sister unit, uh, Doing Business Reform Unit, that actually work with specific governments on improving uh, the indicators and, I mean, again, within the kind of a broader investment climate um, agenda. So we do have ways of, you know, getting the laws very quickly, translate them and, you know, assess uh, whether they affect the indicators or not. It's actually it's the other way around. The practitioners put the law in, but sometimes we need to see the full text as well. So I think we'll, we'll go around that gentleman and then that one. Please. I have used your uh, index to, to do a better presentation. The question I had was um, in terms of methodology, mm -hmm. do you have any benchmark for your measure? For example, the the, the length of days required to submit uh, to register, what would be an acceptable um, number of days and what uh, is not? Uh, I, correct me if I was wrong, I didn't really see that in your experiment. You just rank the number of days and if it's one to, and you list the countries, mm -hmm. the least number of days and the length. So where, what is the benchmark where it's just, okay, this is the index and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, define your role? Um. Mm -hmm. Well, you can see um, the number of days and time and cost uh, it takes in um, all the data is on the website. In terms of um, a best practice or benchmark, again, you can look um, at your specific region or around the world and see who, who are those uh, you know, top 10 countries and what kind of regime they have. Having said that, I always have to em emphasize that one size doesn't fit all. Uh, in each country you have your you know, very specific needs and uh, realities. So maybe having um, just the one day electronic um, startup is not uh, a possibility for a number of countries just due to poor infrastructure, low internet penetration, so on and so forth. So we do not say there is one best practice fits all. What we say that in each income group in each region, you can find um, a country which has expeditious business startup, and you can look at how they've done it and then assess and decide whether this particular model fits you. So this is more for sharing these experiences and um, informing reforms, so we do not take a position that you know this is the best country and this is the best practice. This is up to you to decide. Uh, my question was, when you analyze so much and you know you are like in the midst of these reforms, can you define what are the, the reforms which are the easiest to do and have the best impact, so that you know maybe for the governments. Mm -hmm. which are thinking of reforms, they know which ones they should start with because they're going to have the best implication down the road, you know. Do you do anything like that? You kind of see, like, on the government side how difficult it is mm -hmm. and then see on the, on the receiving side on the economy how, how does that really make mm -hmm. it bad. Mm -hmm. Well, as I mentioned, um, the reform unit really deals with um, uh, advisory on the, on, on the reform side. And they work with you know, each government individually to see uh, what kind of program would make sense in a certain country. I'll give you an example. Um, the Protecting Investors Indicator yeah. deals with a very uh, specific situation um, with the minority uh, shareholders uh, framework. In countries with um, capital markets that are not very developed, where there is no active stock exchange, this is not the first priority reform for obvious reasons. Um, therefore, I mean, I cannot say that certain reforms are more important or less important, it just depends on the country. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, business startup is typically one of the most um, uh, popular reforms, just because, again, intuitively, this is very clear that um, 
creating new companies uh, leads to create job creation. Uh, so that, that, that is pretty straightforward. But in terms of uh, defining the agenda, this is very much an uh, individual, um, individual uh, case and we, we treat it case by case. Uh, what we encourage governments to do is not to look um, at where they rank the worst, um, the lowest uh, on, on, on the use of doing business per indicator, but to see what makes sense for their specific economy. So sometimes it's construction, construction permits, sometimes it's trade, uh, sometimes it's uh, tax administration. And again, we have a sense of uh, how long um, all this reform take place. Again, if we look at um, any kind of electronic registration or electronic filing, it's an expensive reform because it requires you know, quite significant infrastructure. And it takes time. You know, typically, you know, electronic filing uh, for taxes, it's a reform that can take good two, three years. So, and we inform the client that you know, this is the case so that they can take an informed decision. I think uh, you alluded already to it in your previous answer, but I, I wondered um, in your ranking of countries, uh, the rank was basically based on the number of reforms, right? Do you have any uh, uh, measurement of the, the impact or the quality of reforms? Like you, you just said, some reforms are more expensive than others, some take longer than others. Is um, like the, the quality of the reforms, um, like how is that reflected? So the way we um, construct the indicators, again, it's, it's, it's very simple. So there are, there are 10 um, indicators, and um, the total uh, rank is a simple average of the 10. So And then you have different sub-indices within each uh, indicator. So for starting a business, you have time, cost, and number of procedures, and minimum capital requirements. For construction permits and for property, you more or less have, have the same. And then there for legal indices, there again questions um, that one can answer yes and no, which lead, uh, leads to a certain scoring uh, at the end. Then we average all, uh, all 10, and that's what becomes uh, a rank based on the percentile. In terms of quality of the reforms, um, as I mentioned, we only measure what affects the indicators. So uh, again, in protecting investors, if a country reformed uh, its joint stock company law, for example, uh, affording high protections to minority shareholders, that will be reflected in, in the final scoring. And therefore, the rank of the country will, will go up. And there are many instances when significant important reforms are taking place, but they're not being captured by the indicators. That's why I'm saying that this is a very limited instrument. It needs to be used with a lot of caution and, uh, you know, with a lot of um, kind of, you know, external, you know, other um, indicators and, and, and mechanisms. So, so, so the definition of reform then is a move in the indicator outcome, exactly. not a particular action by the government. Well, we can sum up uh, the particular actions that, that typically lead to like changes, but measuring. exactly, yes, this is the outcome, yeah. And then what's, what's been the movement in the aggregate since, since you started picking this up? Mm -hmm. you, for your number of days measures and whatever, mm -hmm. sort of your global averages, are, what are you seeing in terms of, of global average movements on each of these indicators? So what, what we see um, that the, the country, well, first of all, um, in order to become one of the top reformers, the country needs to implement at, at least three reforms. And what we see uh, that in order to improve uh, significantly, for example, last year Azerbaijan jumped from 80-something uh, to 30-something. But they implemented um, you know, six, seven reforms. So that's, that's, that's the influence. So sometimes um, one reform uh, can lead to a significant improvement. Sometimes it's, it's, you know, it's reform across the, uh, across the board. I'm more curious in, in sort of the global, in terms of the global averages, sort of global trends that you might be seeing in your indicators is more my question. You know, is, is the global average sort of number of days required to start a business dropping over the period? Of yeah, as I was showing on one of the slides, yes. So glo globally, as I mentioned, the all countries and all regions are improving. In, in, all, in, in, all, all, in, in all indicators, yes. So because at this point, uh, 151 country out of um, 181 reformed. Right, but I mean, reform is a unidirectional. 
Sure, yes, but uh, again, if we look at the absolute numbers, and I mean, you can download the da data set and you, you will see it. Do you measure the stability of the changes? I mean, for example, a country can change every year, I don't know, fiscal policies for taxes, mm -hmm. and so they will appear in your, um, well, in the in the report that, well, you're making reforms every year, but is that stable, is that good for the business, is that, you know what I mean? Um, well, the way we define stability in, in, in the project, so if you see a reform that uh, took place in a given year, uh, next year we, we send the same survey with new data reflecting the reform to the practitioners, and then we ask them, um, has anything changed? So sometimes countries digress, they um, actually implement negative reforms, Sometimes uh, implementation of a certain reform uh, never took place. So uh, in, in this term, in, in, uh, from, from this point of view, um, this reform is not stable. But uh, this is the only way we can measure that. So it's basically through the feedback from the practitioners and they tell us whether this reform is still taking place or not. Yeah, as I mentioned, we um, conducted a number of subnational and regional studies um, in large countries mm -hmm. like Russia and Central Asian countries, Brazil, uh, Mexico, India, uh, India um, South Asia. So then you can see uh, quite a bit of differences. So yes, yes, that we do. Yeah, the data, it's all, it's all on the website, yes. There is a subnational. Um, yes. It's a public good, so we're very adamant to keep it free. Uh, I, I, I mentioned before, early before presentation, uh, I had a question on other surveys the IFC has. Uh, among them was, if I'm, if I'm, to be correct, if I'm mm -hmm. wrong, the enterprise survey, uh, which you said mm -hmm. is based on perceptions, and mm -hmm. if there are any reconciliation findings, other, uh, if they Well, first of all, um, as we discussed a little bit before the presentation, um, enterprise service look more on a, a qualitative side of things. So they ask entrepreneur, you know, if, if you um, have registered something in the last couple of years, so how was your experience? So the firm uh, level data is um, tend to come out quite differently than um, something that uh, legal practitioners give us because legal practitioners are consolidators. So they, people who register hundreds of uh, similar transact transactions every year, what they give us, they give us a certain average. So the firm based uh, perception, of course, it depends on each uh, individual experience that all those firms had, but for them it's a one-off transaction. So what we're trying to capture is the, is the kind of an average reality that uh, a hypothetical company would uh, have in a given country. We do, ha we do have some work um, showing certain correlations between enterprise survey data and our data. I can email you some things, so you know if you uh, give me your contact information. But in general, we do not really reconcile. I think there are two complementary uh, data sets uh, that allude to two different uh, sides of the same reality. And I think, I mean, they, they can be used uh, in parallel. I have a, a question about the ranking. I also use your data set. I use it in the classroom and, and also for research. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to get that average score in addition to the ranking? I'm always interested, I'm always curious to know what the country really scored. In other words, the average, you just play the average mm -hmm. of those 10 dimensions. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen that score. Uh, you mean the... Well, when you average those 10 mm -hmm. dimensions, doesn't turn out to be a ranking, that's the score. Yes. Where is okay. Score? Uh, you can, you don't see it on this page, but if you go to our front page, uh, there will be a spreadsheet called Simulate Reforms. You, you'll see it's on the um, right hand side. If you open it, it, it will have all the averages. So you will see the gap between the, the, the scores. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, it's there. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
uh, it is there, but you have to remember that you will not get it for all 10 indicators because we didn't have 10 indicators, we only had five. But if you click on uh, 2005, we have, uh, I think it's, uh, there would be somewhere on, uh, oops. Oh, now I have to flip, but um, it, it's on the front page, so you, you, ha you will see it. If you click on get the data, uh, then all data sets are there. But not for all countries and not for all indicators. One last great mm -hmm. question. In the, the literature, you always uh, describe the entrepreneur. When entrepreneur wants to start as an average mm -hmm. student, this also refers to any enterprise that has to go open business in these countries. Mm -hmm. So it's a very broad definition of entrepreneur. Yeah, we use it in a very narrow definition because, as I said, we, all, we always look at the limited liability company and it's always a domestic entrepreneur. So this is, again, it's an important limitation of uh, our methodology. We don't look at the foreign investor or sole entrepreneur or joint stock company, so it's always a limited liability company. But a multinational would have to jump through the same hoops. Not necessarily. It could be a completely different regime for the multinationals. Please. Quick question for you. You were mentioning a, um, a, a lot of issues, a lot of reforms in the Eastern European countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and the EU discussion um, was one of the reasons that they do that. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether you have any insight on um, why some countries have more reforms than others. Is it peer pressure? Is it you know, just going in? It's typically a combination of things. Um, as I mentioned, the new government typically is uh, more inclined uh, to have reforms. Regional pressure, um, most definitely. And uh, at this point, we even have a lot of, uh, we call it regulatory tourism. When companies visit uh, neighboring countries to see how certain reforms were implemented and you know, learn uh, from them when they're designing uh, their reforms. And there could be, you know, specific factors like I mentioned in, um, you know, Azerbaijan, a strategic decision to move away from oil-based economy and encourage other industries. So, I mean, th this is definitely a range of uh, issues. We run out of questions. Mm -hmm. Never. <laughs> 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 But you always have to remember that it's a, it's a city state. So sometimes uh, it's it's easier to reform in in, in, in in such environment than when you deal with a you know huge uh, huge federal system. Okay, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs>